Thank you very much. Uh, can, can anybody hear me with the uh, microphone? Great. Rain Zeng, I'm currently at Virginia Tech. Um, my group does work on additive manufacturing and metamaterials. Architect metamaterials is a suite of materials with design topology and microarchitecture. So it, it connects two key features. One is design topology, and the other is the feature side. So both play a very key role in design of new materials. And of course, additive manufacturing is a suite of technique that has been developed in our lab, is what I'm going to be focusing on for today's talk. So um, before I begin with, I would like to thank all our uh, funding agencies, as well as all my graduate students and, and postdocs who did most of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, my research is motivated by the design, engineering, and expand the property and the uses of materials. So in, in any intrinsic materials, their properties, regardless of its electro, mechanical, or thermal, are governed by their um, crystal structures or their chemical radii and atomic bonds. So once the materials is there, you cannot really change their properties. And that governs all these three major properties and their couplings in between. So for use to select any material for applications, ranging from light weighting to thermal, electrical, or actuation properties, there's very limited set of materials that we can choose from. You can now use one material that to be applied to all these different applications because of the intrinsic material limitations. So let me go to some fundamental concepts. So we all have grown accustomed to the fundamental physical laws from the nature. So imagine if you have a block of materials, if you send this input in, and these are the responses you would expect. If you send an electromagnetic wave in, it will transmit. If you heat it, it will expand. If you crush a material, it will fracture. And if, you, if it's heavy, it's always strong. What if I, right now, we kind of disrupt this notion of creating a magic material, and we call that metal materials, that kind of disrupt all these physics laws. If you send this electromagnetic wave in, it bend over the material. Uh, if you, you heat it, it will shrink. And if you crush the material, it can completely recover. So how would that be possible? That's, you can imagine this is going to be really hard. And I'm going to give you some very concrete example for structural material application. So for any intrinsic materials, their density is always solid material. Their density is always above that of the water, ranging from 1,000 uh, 1, to 10,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So to reduce the density of the material, below that of the water, we don't really have much choice. And the only sensible approach is to introduce porosity inside of the solid materials. So you can create cellular architectures, foams, honeycombs. Those are the pretty much the only way you can reduce the density of the materials in nature and both man-made materials. Their density can be um, um, a few times smaller than, than that of the water. And here I can give you some extreme examples over here. So look at these two materials. So they're as light as below 10 kilogram per cubic meter. What does that mean? That means it's 100 times lighter than water. So these are ultra lightweight materials, but they're made out of heavy materials. So the one that you see on the picture um, is a um, metallic micro lattice made out of uh, nickel phosphorus, it's a metal. And the, the density of metal is you know, over, over around 8,000 8, uh, 8, kilograms per cubic meter. So you can reduce the weight by over two orders of magnitude. And you can see that it's been supported on top of a dander line. So how could that be possible? And for a, this is to look like a stone, but that, that's actually a graphene aerogel. And it can be supported by a plant. So uh, there's no trick here. And the, the way that you do that is to just to keep making the porosities much bigger. And the way you can do it is just to make the solid ligament inside of the porous, porous material to be slender, thinner, reduce the thickness to below hundreds of nanometers or even below. And with that, you have over 99% volume filled by air. So that gives you ultra light, extreme lightweight materials. And then you can imagine you can make a ultralight material out of a heavy and strong material. For example, graphene. Graphene is one of the heaviest, uh, one of the strongest materials 
um, on Earth, it has the stiffness of over 1,000 kilopascal, uh, gigapascal, and their strength is over 10 giga, gigapascal. And now you make them into a lightweight aerogels, and you imagine they can be also very strong. Then we test it, and you can realize that the graphene aerogels, they do not subject to any abuse. Their, their Young's module become lower than one kilopascal, so it, approaching the stiffness of a fat cell. So that what a, a strong material end up become when you reduce the lightweight material. So that, that means all the materials we actually know today are ranging from polymers to metal to ceramic. They are governed by these physical laws. Here is the Young's modulars and density scaling laws. So if you reduce the density by over two or three orders of magnitude, your mechanical property, Young's model or strength or other property, degrade by over nine orders of magnitude. There's just super disproportional degradation of useful material properties as you reduce the density. And that's only because when you reduce the density, you can see all these solid ligaments become loosely connected and they are actually bending dominated. So as soon as you apply any forces, all their structural member will, will bend, will curl. And uh, is it possible if we can engineer materials that go beyond these natural skating law of a, a have a material that go up on this up Ashby chart when you reduce the density, but you have a appreciable uh, Young's modulus and the strength that can fill this white space. So this is an example of a potential structural metal materials. Let's look at also functional materials. So all the functional materials, uh, piezoelectrics, um, those are, you know, you see this type of material in your cell phone, all different type of electronic devices, but they're really very difficult to be made. You have to rely on clean room fabrication technologies to, de de to deposit these thin films and to pattern it, and you have very limited control of, the, uh, of their stiffness and functionality. So what you end up having is, so if you want to have their functionality, constant, you end up with a very low compliance. These type of materials are very brittle and very hard to be manipulated. So what we end up having is all these conventional materials come within limited shapes and for form factors. So you can have to very carefully mount these sensors into particular application or pattern them for your desired application. So let me go into our first uh, work on structural metal materials. So these are uh, micro lattice aerogels that um, we made a few years ago. We published this work on science um, in 2014. And what we did is we created a ultralight um, micro lattice aerogel. So these aerogels has a density below 10 kilogram per cubic meter. So it's more than 100 times uh, lighter than water. But it can sustain weight of more than 10,000 times of their own weight without any visible deformation. They're ultralight but also very strong. And we put a um, control material in comparison, a steel foam, and we can see that the steel foam is way heavier than this micro lattice, but already deforms uh, with half of the weight it can support. Okay? And now we coat this micro lattice, we deposit it with a thin layer of metal. So it's nickel phosphor, it's actually a, a amorphous metal, it's pretty brittle. And then etch away these polymer, leaving behind a hollow tube metallic lattice. And then we crush it, just like you, you crush a can of Coke, and let's see what happens. So you crush this micro metallic micro lattice to their strength of over 90%, over 80% to 90%. You can see, no matter how many times you crush it, and always recover. And it doesn't matter which direction you crush it, whichever direction that you can choose, they can always recover. Um, and these type of materials are designed by microarchitectures. So they are highly connected microarchitectures. And if you look at their scanning electron microscope images, you can see each individual ligament is connected, each node is connected by over 12 structural members, uh, despite having these really large uh, volume fractions. And you can see these micro lattice with different lens scales, and they are highly connected at much lower density. That gives us the the high rigidity. This is a very simple concept. And the beauty of this type of metamaterial design is that if you look at their unicell, um, no matter how you load it, it always remains stretch dominant. There are no structural member will carry bending. So all their forces will be distributed in the actual directions. 
and you can pack them in different orientations and to, so that you can design these type of metal material. Just like you design a crystalline structure that have different orientation, different faces, and you can test their mechanical properties in different orientations, and what you realize is that they're also fairly isotropic. No matter how you load it, they always remain a, a very um, lucrative scaling between stiff relative density and stiffness, way better than the honeycomb or any other uh, bending dominated foams. And we also observe very interesting structural size effect. So we fabricate this, this is a high temperature ceramic um, silicon oxycarbide material with identical geometries but with different feature sizes. These lattice tubes ranging from geometry of hundreds of micrometers to a few uh, millimeters and centimeters. You can see that with these identical uh, geometries, when you test their strength, the smaller the architecture, the higher the strength it is. So what you really want to do is to fabricate large scale lattice structures with small feature size, with micro or nanometer length scale feature size so that you can harness this smaller, the stronger effect. And then we convert these type of materials into um, different type of material constituent, ranging from polymers to metal, um, hollow tube ceramic and solid ceramic, and which I'm gonna go through the process in a little bit. And then you can change the design parameters such that they have a relative density span over three orders of magnitude. And then we test their stiffness. And then we plot these, all these materials, you can see they have a really nice near linear scaling between relative density of Young's modul modulars. At this ultra lightweight regime, um, below 10 kilogram per cubic meters, they have orders of magnitude higher stiffness and strength than uh, carbon aerogels and, or graphene aerogels, okay? So this is the basic concept of metal material. So you really need a uh, three-dimensional, highly connected topology, microarchitectures. And secondly, you really need a feature size controls in the micro and nanometer level. And here we, I'm, I'm, I would like to go through the um, process. So we develop a suite of um, SRA-based but it's a different type of uh, way to, to project it, to shrink the size of these projection area to much smaller sizes. And you can actually grow these materials inside of liquid resin really fast. And this is in contrast with any other three-dimensional printing technique. If you use extrusion type of direct ink writing, you have to write voxel by voxel. So imagine if you run, write hundreds or, 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 or thousands of these microarchitectures you don't want to know how long it's going to take. And also, for two-photon lithography, they have really um, small feature size, but also you have to write voxel by voxel. So those are the limitations for other um, commercially available three-dimensional painting methods. So the one we develop is kind of like a DLP, but with the fully custom customizable features. So you start with three-dimensional CAD model, so you slice it into digital layers. So each layer represents a video frame of, your, um, of the CAD geometry. And you send this video down to a UV curable resin bath. And then you can effectively grow a lattice structure inside of the resin. So as you um, move down the, um, the stage, you can actually grow the structure inside of the stage without having to step each individual layer. So you can see this, you basically project the video frame. So each frame represents a cross section of the CAD model and then send it to a a uh, light sensitive uh, liquid. And here's some of the uh, process that you can actually see. You send this two dimensional uh, frames. Each frame represents a cross section of a highly complex fractal lattice networks. And you basically send these frames onto the resin bath. And we, we completely configure our system so that you could actually see what's inside of the fabrication chambers. Um, here's the actually in situ video. This is played 4x speed, so it's actually four times lower than what you actually see. Uh, so we are fabricating a small micro-scale Eiffel Tower, and what you can actually see is inside of liquid, there's one layer that is not polymerized, but beneath that layer, you can actually drag the, the lattice structure inside the resin bath. And this technique doesn't, you don't even need to, to rely on any you know, oxygen membranes. The entire system is immersed inside of a UV sensitive monomer. So we configure our system, we study the, the material printability, how do you make any type of material pro processes. We're really focusing on a few different type of um, high temperature materials. 
And this include uh, high temperature ceramic silicon oxycarbide, silicon carbide. So what we did is you synthesize these pre-ceramic monomer. So, and then after you fabricate green body and you convert it using um, pyrolysis, convert it into pure silicon oxycarbide. In this process, there's no particle involved. There's no sintering involved. So what you end up with is highly dense um, high temperature ceramic arrays with virtually no porosities. Uh, using the similar procedure, um, you can actually um, fabricate other type of graphene lattice structures. Um, you, you, f you synthesize these graphene aerogels, disperse it into a UV curable monomer, and you make them into a graphene oxide resin, and then you, you fabricate the green body, and then you, you use these pyrolysis procedure and convert that into architectured graphene. And you can see at each ligament, it contains layers of these interconnected graphene sheets, and you test their mechanical property, you can see their orders of magnitude higher than that of these graphene aerogels. So I forgot to also show that this is a slide just to show this high temperature silicon oxide carbide materials. It can sustain temperature over 1700 degrees C. What we show is just use a 800 degrees C hot, red hot steel and to sit on top of these uh, uh, micro lattice structure that is only weighs about 20 milligrams. Okay, so these are fabricating structural materials. This is baseline technology. We also are developing method that allows you to do multi-material uh, light-based projection stereolithography. What we did is you can actually switch between different feedstock and inject this feedstock into the UV polymer, uh, UV sensitive chamber, and then you can switch between different feedstock material and do your fabrication, and you end up with these multi-colored uh, lattice structures uh, with microscope feature size. And each color does not only represent color, but you can really blend different material properties from functional materials to materials with a different stiffness or even thermal expansion coefficient to actually co-print them inside of a three-dimensional architectures. Um, here's some structural example. So by architecting materials with different stiffness, into an exotic structure, you can actually observe some extreme negative Poisson ratio. The extreme negative Poisson ratio here we demonstrated they have a Poisson ratio of negative seven, which means that if you pull it on one end, the other end will expand seven times larger than the, than the end where you apply the force. But it's fully terrible by changing the ratio between different stiffness. And here you can actually have distributed Poisson ratio, so one, um, one section is, is contract, is expand, the other section have a positive Poisson ratio. Or you can design your structure that they can have zero Poisson ratio. Um, we also recently developed a technique using these um, patterning approach, charged polymer patterning approach that allows you to deposit different materials. What you can see is we can actually deposit these uh, conducting materials, metal, inside of a three-dimensional architecture that give you different antenna arrays or uh, polymer foams where you can have these um, either copper-coated or, um, or nickel-phosphorus-coated material inside of a three-dimensional structure. You can arbitrarily deposit your conducting materials inside of a complex architecture. And here are some of the, the examples. Uh, so we use uh, scanning electron microscope as evidence that to show you can actually achieve three-dimensional patterning of functional materials. So here's a dielectric polymer with uh, nickel phosphorus, and you can also co-deposit different metal or, or metal with semiconducting materials with, or oxide. Here's an example of magnetite with copper co-deposit onto a lattice structures. And then you can see different peaks. We, we, we try different type of material combinations. In, at the end of the day, you can achieve arbitrary com combination of dielectric properties and conductivity inside of a three-dimensional architecture. I'm going to go through some of the uses with this. We are exploring their antenna application and also sensing actuation application as well. Here's some of the example. You can achieve the electrode distribution inside of three-dimensional uh, architectures. And here's some uh, Air Force target. And here's the resolution. Basically, you can hit that into um, hit the resolution or feature size in a time 10 micron level regime. Here you can also have functional materials to be co-deposited with metal. 
And here the example showing piezoelectrics. So the white area is piezoelectric, and here is the, the metal part. So you can actually deposit electrode uh, to make it addressable inside of a piezoelectric lattice architectures. Uh, with this type of um, electrostatic patterning technique, you can actually achieve volumetric deposition of um, arbitrary sensors. Um, here's an example of a soft robotic where we, um, this is a soft material, and you just deposit, everything is fabricated in one shot. You don't have to do extrusion or ink writing, and you can basically have these wiring um, just de deposited in one time, and then you can get these uh, sensor arrays, which is a capacitance array, and you, you, you bend or move the structures, and these sensor array will output the strain distribution. You can do three-dimensional mapping of shapes as you move or manipulate these this structures. Um, those are kind of like the baseline material patterning approach that we have been developing. We're also looking at scalability. So uh, it's a nice thing to have is to have a, a high resolution, but the, the limitation is, is always for any fabrication technology, if you have high resolution, your overall built volume becomes much smaller, right? Uh, the two-photon lithography is the most um, precise three-dimensional printing technique, but if you want to print anything uh, with a dimension above one centimeter, you don't want to know how long that's going to take. It's probably going to take uh, months or even somebody say half a year to achieve that. And so how do we solve those kind of limitations. So basically, we, we still based on our projection microstereolithography approach. So instead of um, stitching the layers, we basically, instead of scanning a single laser beam as the SLA approach, we scan the entire image pattern. So basically, you come out your DMD, which is the um, digital image, and go through a scanning mirror. So that scanning mirror rotates really fast, allows you to switch the image to a much wider area. But of course, you have to coordinate um, the exposure time so that the movement of the scanning mirror is in coordinate with the exposure time so that you can actually smoothly fabricate a larger scale architecture. So this is basically inspired by scanning microscope in tissue engineering where you want to see the individual cellular level, but you also want to get a whole field of view of the tissue level. So you want to scan the Galvo mirror so that you can scan much larger uh, imaging captured areas. So with that, you can actually fabricate lattice, a batch of micro lattice for testing, hundreds, tens of them in one batch. Here, one example of the, perhaps this is the largest metal materials that has ever been fabricated. And here you have over um, five centimeters, but with one million strut members. Uh, you can see these are lattice made out of smaller lattices. And with that, you can investigate a few very interesting um, mechanics problem. Here we're collaborating with uh, Vikram Deshmani from the University of Cambridge of really using this technique to, to, to access how fracture toughness um, play out in architectural materials. Because these are very discretalized structures. In order to study their fracture toughness, your flaw size have to be much larger than your unit cell size. So you really need to to have a way to scale up this technique so that each crack can contain a lot of unit cells, as opposed to each crack only contains a few limited number of unit cells. In that, you, with that, you can basically treat the materials more like an effective continuum, and then to study their interesting uh, fracture mechanics problem. I'm not gonna go into more details. And here's our one of the uh, exploration space that we have been working on over the past years of looking at fractal-like metal materials. What are the design space you could achieve? And this is still ongoing, and you can actually see we can achieve arbitrary stress strain curves uh, with combination of different architecture at multiple hierarchical level. So one example is a nickel phosphorus metal material that we created. So you fabricate the green body, you electrically place it with a thin layer of nickel and then actual weight of polymer. And here, um, if you zoom in one order of magnitude, you can see this recurring microarchitecture spanning over seven orders of magnitude with the smallest of feature size being um, 60 nanometers. But at each individual length scale, you, you can see a discernible three-dimensional architecture. So it's a fractal-like. 
Uh, with that, you can de design this ligament uh, aspect ratios, their, their relative density at each individual hierarchical level. Long story short, um, you could design their deformation mode so you can have different stress strain curves and to make a brittle materials to be more flexible by controlling their buckling mode at a smaller length scale. One simulation example that you can see this, you design in such a way that the hierarchical level beam buckled first. Or you can design in such a way that the small ligament, the nanoscale wall, shell, start to buckle first. And that is that gives you the, the highest stability of these type of materials. You can only see this small uh, buckling. That's why it gives you a very large um, compressive strain for these type of um, metallic matter material because you can sequentially activate this buckling mode without hitting their fracture strength. Um, you can also design this combination of hierarchies to make these uh, uh, metallic lattice to have a larger tensile strain. And here you can, you can stretch it without breaking. Um, if you don't design it in that way, you know, just like any uh, metallic microarchitecture, you just fracture uh, instantly. Um, here, these are the examples. Uh, with that, I'm also going to talk about um, some simple design concept of hierarchical matter material. So uh, we have been developing an algorithm that allows you to embed uh, different architectures inside of matter material. So imagine you have a bulk material here. You want to design architecture. You divide it into a periodic array. And at each unit, you insert one unit cell. And you, that gives you a first order periodic lattice structures. And then you can zoom into the unit cell and do this recursively of divide that unit cell into smaller quadrants and fill that with a different type of unit cell. And you can mix and match different topologies uh, and achieve different combinations of unit cells. And each combination will give you a unique um, structural material behavior. So we're, we have an Air Force project working on looking at twistability or even bendability for uh, inorganic materials by designing these feature size across different hierarchical levels. Okay, so now I would like to switch gears a little bit. We have been talking about structural materials. My group have recently moved to multifunctionalities, looking at what would happen if you can architecting multifunctional material or functional materials with a topology, what is going to happen? So first we focus on piezoelectric materials. So it's a material that convert uh, electric charges, voltages into strain or vice versa. And the, the working principle of piezoelectrics is that all their, you know, um, they have a unit cell and the unit cell geometry, the crystalline orientation dictate their piezoelectric constants. So once this is there, you cannot change anything. You have to go with whatever their operational mode is to, for different applications. So we figured out a way um, of printing these type of piezoelectric materials by synthesizing a colloid um, solution contains a very large volume fraction of piezoelectrics. So they have a volume fraction of over 40%. So basically, the entire volume is filled with these piezoelectric nanoparticles, and then you functionalize it with uh, this UV-sensitive monomer which are entrapped in between these nanoparticles. And then you print it, and you can actually see that the, the, we fabricate them into films, and then you can see their piezoelectric constant um, reach a level of um, almost 100 um, picocoulomb per, per newtons, um, better than the com conventional, commercially available PVDF, which is soft piezoelectric materials. And of course, the higher loading that you have, the higher piezoelectric constant you have. Um, Here's, uh, we also have been doing the modeling that allows you to optimize the piezoelectric constant and the stiffness of the material. So you can design arbitrary combination of piezoelectric constant and compliance so that they are not a trade-off. In conventional piezoelectric, the higher stiffness, um, the higher piezoelectric constant is. But here we can you know, uh, tailor the shape of piezoelectric architectures and then achieve maximum functionalization level between the piezoelectric nanoparticle and the monomer such that um, you can still have a manage a good compliance but also optimize the piezoelectric constant by breaking the traditional trade-off between functionality and compliance which is always desired and some of the example you can actually tune 
these compliance over several orders of magnitude. That gives you a flexible energy harvester. For example, if you mount electrode on top, it convert the voltage of the bending strand into voltages, and you can use use them as a uh, energy harvest. But use also they can absorb energy of making them to be very stiff. Um, you drop, we sequentially drop different weight on top of it, and you can see um, by mounting electric on top and bottom surfaces, they, in, they, they can in situ output voltages as the weight drop on top of it. And, and then by reading the voltage on the top layer and bottom layer, you can actually read how much energy has been absorbed. Um, by using our technique of, of embedding electrode inside of the materials, you can actually achieve addressable electronic readout. Um, here's an example that you can see with embedded electrode. Um, these are piezoelectric lattice with embedded electrode on each individual layer. You can actually, um, within the scale of one millisecond, you can trace the voltage output at each, individual, at each embedded location um, of the lattice structures. And it can give you a map that trace the elastic wave distribution inside of lattice materials under impact. Also, you can use that as energy harvester, being flexible as you, you keep stretching it, a cyclic response, you can actually harvest energy for different applications. Um, because the entire structure is functional, you can actually use them as tactile sensor. Um, wherever you put these, um, give their input, these structure will output voltage at that particular location. So the entire system is smart. So here's an example of the piezoelectric bridge. So you just randomly drop a weight on top of it by just mounting these electrodes wherever you want, and they can tell you where the impact comes from. So we published this work uh, earlier this year on Nature Materials. And the other, I'm not sure how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, the other area I want to tap into is we just talk about architecture. So what happens to these functional architectures? So for lattice materials, imagine for structural property, you have their strength, stiffness, tensor. But for electrical mechanical property, you also have these electromechanical mechanical coupling tensor. It's a third rank, rank tensor, and tradition is dictated by the crystalline orientation. And here, as you print it into three-dimensional lattice, what you can see is um, if you polarize in one direction and then you give forces in different, orienta different directions, they have their distinct voltage response. So it's not a film. So wherever you give direction, you can read the voltage output that corresponds to the force in that particular direction. But by using the architecture, by designing these architecture orientations, uh, you could design and calculate your piezoelectric tensor. Um, for example, these are the unicell design. So you change the orientation of the unicell design. And on the map over here, just shows the piezoelectric tensor. Just in the plane of D33 and D3, D31, you can see this vector kind of rotate um, in any direction corresponding to your design orientations. By using this methodology, um, you can design a suite of piezoelectric architectures and that can reach pretty much any spot um, inside of a, um, the piezoelectric tensor array. So you can achieve ar almost arbitrary combination of their directional response. So if that looks kind of weird to you, here's an example demo. So look at these fabricated piezoelectric lattice. They, always, they all have the same cubic dimensions. But if I, I give forces in different directions, you can see at each direction, they have drastically different output. In one direction, their voltage become negative. One direction, they become zero. And in one um, design, they all become positive. So you can kind of mix and match these uh, functional architectures into a lattice, larger scale lattice. Um, by, by designing these piezoelectric signatures so, so that if you give a force in any random directions by reading the voltage mat, map, they can tell you where the force comes from by programming the, the uh, tensor distribution inside of the, uh, each individual unicell block. So we have been uh, working with the Navy Office of Naval Research of testing um, the, the sound emission and sound receiving by using these lattice design concept and put it in underneath of the water, 
and then detect where the sound source comes from by detecting their piezoelectric voltage signals um, in different directions. Also, the benefit is you have a very low dielectric constant um, with a high volume fraction, and also impedance match is also another benefit of using designed lattice as a sensor array or actuators. Okay, so um, thank you, and I'd like to, to wrap up my talk, and thank my sponsor, and also I'm going to move to UCRA. Uh, my group is moving there next month, so if any student or postdoc are interested, feel free to send me an email there. Thank you. <laughs>